It's Patio Side Chats with Fernando Martinez from Chaparral Pavers with tips and advice on landscaping and gardening. Here's Fernando Martinez. Yes, I am. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another great show here. Thanks for joining me on this Patio Side Chat of the day. Today's topic, I want to talk about process and references. Very, very important when it comes to any landscaping project. I've been thinking about what to do for the show today and kind of reflecting on experiences I've had this week. And we've been hiring a couple new employees and I've been working hard on, on explaining process and using references during that process when it comes to building things. And so it really has helped me become a better teacher. And I thought, well, uh, this radio show here is about learning and, and explaining things and, and helping, you know, any listening public out there, I hope someone's listening, <laughs> hard to tell from inside this room here, there's nobody. Um, it's, it's so, so important and I think can be intimidating part of any job because when it comes down to it, a lot of the materials, you know, especially these days with interlocking, you know, pavers or the mortarless stackable, you know, retaining walls and a lot of these things are, are seemingly simple you know, for a homeowner to take on the project by themselves, if you don't want to, you know, hire it out and have it done professionally. And you're thinking if it's maybe it's a smaller project and, or maybe you like doing that kind of thing and having that gratification at the end of the job. I know I do. I never get tired of that gratification of finishing a project and just kind of taking a step back. And if it's a front yard, I'll go out in the street and kind of just overlook the whole thing. And it's, there's such a great uh, sense of accomplishment and to be able to do that as a job and a service for clients that just, that's one of the reasons I really love my job and I, I don't, it hasn't gotten old yet. I don't foresee that happening, you know, in a backyard, if you have a two story house, it's kind of fun to go up to second story and look down and wow, you know, just the different viewing angles and really enjoy it. And if you've had a part in that, the building uh, of that, I absolutely can understand why you would want to do a project, you know, weekend warrior type deal on your own. So I thought it would be a good idea to talk a little bit about um, how the order of things, how they need to be done, you know, uh, in the process and also referencing it. <laughs> Because a lot of times I'll say, oh, it's, uh, you know, you get this terminology in construction. And really this goes for any construction project. If you're working on interior inside the house or around the house or outside or whatever, it's construction in general. If you don't have a reference point, you're, you're dead in the water. You're for sure it's got, something's going to go wrong. It's not going to be right. It's going to be off. You know, if it's a pattern or a block or you're trying to keep something level, or you're trying to go straight, you need a reference point. Absolutely. And that's kind of one of the things I learned is I was trying to explain it and really, you know, sit down and physically train somebody on, on these methods and some of the methodology that I've come up with over the years with real world experience to say, here's, here's a way, you know, here's a, it makes it streamlined, you know, it's simple to understand and, you know, how do I explain that to somebody? And it's reference, reference, reference. You have to be able to reference something. So if I'm putting in a retaining wall, for instance, and I'm wanting to be, you know, three feet from the fence, say, and if I keep going down and I'm three feet from the fence the whole way down, but the fence is crooked, my wall is going to be crooked. It's not going to look good. It's going to stray off, you know, and so you want to... um be able to find a point of reference that's going to be solid rock stone doesn't move is true. And it can, I mean, as can be, I mean, within reason, you know, I mean, nothing's going to be perfect. Even, even the house, you hope the house is square and level. I mean, you know, it's close. I'm sure nothing's going to be perfect, but at least we can have a good starting point. So for instance, if I was 30 feet off the house with my first block and I go down, 40 feet down the house, I can take another measurement. And by the time that wall, if I'm in line, you know, 
parallel with the house, I should be 30 feet off the other corner of the house. And the house isn't going to move. The house usually is a little more a reliable of a line. And so you can use that house would be your reference point. But even once you get out and you lay, you're going to lay that first block, you need to know how deep to be. So you say, well, it should be two inches, you know, below grade. Well, what grade? And, and now grade, this word of what the level of the soil is, is now the new reference. So it's, it's a constant shifting thing of reference points. So I think like putting the retaining wall blocks out, stacking them on top of each other is not the intimidating part of the project. Figuring out where to start, how to start, what to reference, where are the lines going to be? How deep am I going to need to be? And and follow that process of instructions, either by the manufacturer or you know what you've learned over time. Um, it's just so so important. So let's take the retaining wall example, and and let's say I would choose the bottom of the house. There's usually a little weep screed or some sort of point there. And if I were doing a back wall, and let's say. I wanted to be 10 feet away from the house or say 20 feet. Um, you could measure five different points along the back side of the house and go 20 feet out and you could put stakes all along there. And then that would be a pretty a good assemblance of a of parallel straight line with the house to keep that wall going straight. You can also run a string line between all those stakes to help you see where the block should be in you know, relation to those stakes as you're going, as you're working and laying the blocks in between the stakes. I like to put the stakes a little high and I get tall, like three foot stakes, pound them in the ground. And as you're stacking the blocks, what I do is I, I make that line, the string line go on the back of the block and I line up the back of the blocks all the way down that row. And that string is my reference point for setting the blocks so that I, my line doesn't start going off and curving. Um, the reference point of where the wall is to the house are where the string is in that direction. And the height of the wall would be in reference to the level of, with the bottom of the house. And we like to go two inches below that. So you would have to take another st stake at the house and a stake out to the, to where the wall is and level that string. So it could be as easy as getting a, uh, one of those little string levels that you just attach to the string. You can level it out. 20 feet is kind of far. That's about the max I would go with one of those string levels. And make sure that string is nice and tight. And another way to do it, probably a little more accurate, would be getting a laser level. And, you know, figuring out how to use the laser level and getting that set. And make sure that that's rock solid, doesn't move, nobody bumps into it. And you can take your little stick out there. And one of the way a laser level works is it beeps. Um, you set it at a certain level, you go up to the house and say you want to be two inches below grade. I would go two inches below that weep screed because who knows where the dirt is. Once you get out there, you're going to be excavating the dirt. And then you set your laser level point at that two inches below the house. You lock down the little sensor on the stick, which is like a big giant ruler. And, and as long as that laser level doesn't move, you should be able to take your stick out to where the blocks go and go up to your stake and go up and down with, with that ruler, the big giant, you know, ruler that comes with it, and you mark that stake at that two inches below, and that should be the bottom of your first block. So it might be a little hard to follow on a radio show about how to build a block wall, but my, my main point really is just to reference something that you know is not going to move, make a point there, figure out a way to transfer that point out into the field where the wall is going to go, Using a laser level is a good idea. String level, you're not going to be that far off. You get that string level pretty close and the string's tight. And then you've got a, a decent starting point. And then you're using the house again as a reference to make that nice straight line. If there's nothing out there and there's not even a house yet, you can just run a string. You use a street. There's a curb. There's usually something. And use that of what you, way you want. Um, and then if you just run a string line, at least it'll be straight with itself. It doesn't necessarily have to be parallel to anything if you don't want it to be. And then there's always curves. <laughs> you can just curve it to your heart's content and then who cares, but you still are going to have to get the right height and those stackable blocks. Actually, I think it's however high you go. 
In other words, if you're if you're three feet high, you should be three inches below grade. Two feet high, you're two inches below grade. So you you can't have that first block sitting right on the soil level because as pressure hits that wall, it's going to want to kick out the toe. Now the same goes for pavers. So I love laser levels. I think they're they're our best friend out in the field, and you can rent them by the day at rental yards. I don't expect anybody to buy fifteen hundred, eighteen hundred dollar laser level, but you can rent them for the day and get an idea of if you're going to do a paver project. Same thing. Mostly they're back patios or walkways or the touch. It's a driveway. It's going up to the garage floor. You use that initial starting point as your reference. That sets your height automatically if it's a garage floor. If it's an entry or back patio, I go two inches below that weep screed. And then that's your new reference point, your starting point where you're going to go out. And you get the string lines to get your stakes all out there like we talked about, running in the distance of whatever the patio is going to be against the house. And then just on the other side, go past... If you're going 20 feet out, set the stakes at 20 feet, six inches. So they're outside where the pavers are going to be and level those strings out so that they're level. Now you want fall. They want the water flowing off away from the house. So you're going to have to lower those strings down. So they have an angle. So to have the water flow off the magic number there is quarter inch per foot. So for every foot you go, you'll be a quarter inch lower. And even just knowing this stuff and having a little bit of knowledge will help. Even if you're hiring a licensed contractor or anyone to go out there and do a job for you, ask that, Hey, what kind of fall are we going to have here on this patio? Where's the water going to run off to? How many inches uh, down are you going to be from the house here? So if you're quarter inch per foot, every four feet is one inch. So if your patio goes four feet out, you're going to be an inch lower there than you would at the house. If it's eight feet out, you're going to be two inches lower. If you're 10 feet out, you're going to be two and a half inches lower at the end of the pavers than you would be at the house. And so what we do is we take all our stakes, take our laser level, mark all the the stakes level, and then the stakes that are away from the house where the patio is going to be falling, we go down. If it's 10 feet, we go down two and a half inches, mark that, tie the string there and tie the string back at your reference point at the house. And you now have that fall, that slope, and you can excavate to that because you now have a reference that you're excavating to. We go down seven and a quarter inches, remove all the soil, bring in four inches of base, and now you're three and a quarter inches below the strings. That leaves room for one inch of sand, inch and a quarter of the pavers. If you follow that process and you use your references and double checking, triple checking your references all the time, if a stake gets kicked, moved, you trip over a string, you want to reset them and get them as close as you can. It's not going to be perfect, but it can be really close. And that way, if you take on a, a you know, weekend warrior project and you're going to put in a, a paver patio, you're not going to end up with puddles or water running towards the house or having to take them up and redo them or having too much fall. I've seen that as well. I don't know water's going up the house, but who wants to sit on a chair at a you know, look like you're leaning over to the side there. (laughs) Um, You know, it's just not good. You want to, yeah, I always say go quarter inch per foot, no more or no less. Definitely no less. If you had to err, I would err on the side of a little bit more, but I don't want to go any more than I have to, to get water to run off that patio because you kind of want it to be as level as can be for usability of, you know, relaxing out there. And when we put a fire pit in, Like if we did a Morrow Stone um, fire pit, just the blocks sitting on top of the pavers, I don't want the fire pit to be at an angle. So you can level that area out right there. There's not going to be any water going in, you know, on the fire pit necessarily. It's going to be covered with, you know, lava rock and block and whatnot and the plate for the burner or whatever. So we level that area out for pavers. So you can do little level areas in the pavers if you need to or for table and chairs or whatever. And, um, you know, that's why I love pavers. It's so flexible like that. It's not like it would be kind of difficult to do that pouring concrete. Um, so very friendly products, very, uh, you know, I call homeowner friendly that you can, some of these projects, you know, especially if they're smaller, there's no reason why you can't do that. And so that's what I really wanted to just kind of talk about. They didn't want to go too deep into this, you know, explanations as far as construction mentality and lingo goes, but you got to get the point, you know, it's, it's, 
doing a project, having, um, you know, the enough to know about references, where things need to be, kind of how it needs to be installed before you decide, you know, whether you're going to take it on or not, before you order all the pavers in the block. I can't tell you how many times I get the phone call. Well, I've got, they call me, we want a paver driveway or a patio and, um, you know, we have all the pavers and we've already excavated and it's ready to go. So I'm thinking to myself, well, why didn't you just lay the pavers down here? Why, you know, why do all that work and every, because they weren't sure of how the process was. They weren't sure what the reference was. And when I go there, it's not excavated correctly. They kind of got in over their head and it, you know, whatever, it's no one's fault. And I'm not judging anybody. It's just that they didn't really think it through. And then they call me and then now I'm in there and I'm having different opinions, different ideas of like, well, if you'd call me before you ordered anything or, or explain to me what kind of you wanted for the project, I would have done this differently or that differently or whatever it is. And so you come in and we have to backtrack a little bit. It might even cost you, you know, a little more than if you had just, you know, called to begin with or done a little bit of research, understood whether you actually want to take that project on or not. And if you do, absolutely um, know where to start, know where your reference points are going to be, know what the falls are going to be, make that wall nice and straight and level. We've all seen them. You see the retaining wall where it's kind of up and down and around and it's just like, okay, that guy did it himself. You don't want your project to look like, hey, you did this yourself on the weekend, huh? I mean, if it's that obvious, then, you know, you can kind of tell that the craftsmanship is not there. You know, they didn't use a level. You didn't run the string or or it's settling now. We didn't do the proper compaction underneath of the base or whatever. So I just want you to have a good experience and really think kind of the project through and understand what you're getting yourself into and how to reference and what the process is going to be. So uh, we're going to talk, it, it even applies to plant material. And that's what I want to talk about next is how all this applies to plants and plantings. So we'll be right back. You're listening to Patio Side Chats with Fernando Martinez from Chaparral Pavers on California's Central Coast. Here on 1240 AM and 99.5 FM, KSMA. This show is brought to you by Airval Block. Concrete paving stones or pavers are not all created equal. Airval Block pavers are created from a dry mix of gravel, sand, cement, and color. With very little water used, they're super strong. They won't crack or fade. And to be an air vol block paver, the gravel and sand come from right here on the Central Coast, supporting our local community. Air vol block is the only local manufacturer of concrete masonry products like pavers, mortarless retaining wall blocks. Air vol block products are high quality for peace of mind, and there are many colors to choose from. And if you're not sure which products you need or how to use them, you will always get expert advice from the staff at Air vol block. Products made on the Central Coast for the Central Coast. Visit their fully landscaped outdoor showroom to see the many ways you can use Airval Block products at number one Suburban Road in San Luis Obispo or go online at airvolblock.com. If you're thinking about installing a new paver patio or paver driveway, check out Chaparral Pavers online at ilovetocomehome.com. Serving the Central Coast since 2001, Chaparral Pavers will work with you to get it right and complete the job to your specifications, as customer service is king at Chaparral Pavers. Paver driveways are stylish and durable and guaranteed to never crack. If your old concrete driveway or entryway is a hazardous cracking mess, it's time to call Chaparral Pavers. Go to their website, ilovetocomehome.com. You'll find all the information you need. Check out photographs of past installations and reviews from Central Coast residents who have used Chaparral Pavers. And don't forget, all installations are guaranteed for the life of your home. So check out Chaparral Pavers online at ilovetocomehome.com. Chaparral Pavers, they'll make you love to come home. Now, back to Patio Side Chats with Fernando Martinez from Chaparral Pavers on KSMA. And we're back. Okay, we are talking about process and references. Kind of a nuts and bolts episode today, so sorry about that. But uh, I felt it was really important to 
you know, thinking about when we're doing the weekend warrior projects and, you know, sometimes they can end up being months of projects that you're biting off more than you can chew or it just takes longer than it should because you haven't really thought it all the way through and you went ahead and ordered a bunch of materials and blocks and pavers and whatever the project is uh, construction wise, it can take a while. And even just the, the moving all the blocks. And if you do something that isn't, you know, exactly what you thought or did it right the first time you end up doing, having to do more work or having the project take longer. So today is about giving you as much information as you can so that we can really either make a good decision, whether we're going to take the project on or not. And if we do, we have a good starting point. Uh, we understand what the process is and what we're referencing so that it goes as fast as it can. Once all the blocks and pavers, everything gets there, you move in them one time, Maybe you can pre-excavate, you know, ahead of time before they get there. Even things like where you're going to set the pallets when they show up, having that space ready. So you have to make the least amount of trips back and forth to the shortest distance to uh, where they're going to go. I love projects where we have access with a forklift and you can just set the pallets kind of like right by, for instance, if you had a retaining wall and it's going to be a hundred feet long, don't put all the pallets out front on the street. Go, if you can get the forklift back there, Line them up, figure out how many blocks you're gonna, it's going to take for how many feet and set the pallets at those distances. And man, it just makes a project go that much faster. If you already have an idea of how far you need to excavate, what you need to reference and how the process is going to go and what, and you're referencing and double checking and triple checking and using laser levels or string lines and stakes and marking paint, whatever it takes to get this thing right then you're going to have a good experience. You're going to have a much faster experience and the project's going to turn out exactly the way you thought. And you're going to have that gratification when you finish. It's so fun. I love working outside. I love doing projects, building things and seeing the end result, and then using it essentially, you know, and enjoying your life every time you come home. That's why we say, I love to come home (laughs) dot com. So anyway, um, I, the last thing I want to talk about today was how that applied to plant material. Cause it's really everything without reference. You're dead in the water. There's just whatever the project is. That's the, if you can take anything away from this show today, it's that it, it's, you have to ask yourself when you're laying block or you're laying papers, what am I referencing right now? What, what am I laying this in relation to how deep am I in relation to what? And, and that answer is always a reference. And they make sure the reference doesn't move. It's solid. It's like a stone or rock that doesn't move. It's, it's solid. But here's the, here's the tricky part. That reference is constantly moving because it changes from that grade or two inches below weep screed or 10 feet off the house. Or, and each block that you put on, it becomes the new reference now. And that level has, has to be level. And so... Really, it's a, it's a moving target, but having a reference and, and as that reference changes, like we were talking about when it comes to pavers, it's the stakes, you know, it's the strings. And then once the road base down, it becomes the road base is now the reference. You're putting sand down. Now the sand is our reference point. So if that gets messed up and somebody walks across there, or the sand gets moved, it's hard, it's hard to go back and re-reference something. You have to get up like a long screed border and reference the sand that hasn't been moved and get it you know, straight and back in there so you can finish the paper job. So anyway, I did want to talk about how it relates to plants and it's the, kind of the same thing. So how you get low maintenance with plant material is understanding how big they're going to get and placing them that far from another plant or more and or near a house or pipes or valves or any kinds of things like that where the plants can interfere with And so again, it's referencing. So you, if a plant gets three feet wide and you don't want to trim it all the time, you know, you can plant it six feet from another plant that also gets three feet wide and they'll get, you know, and they they always say three feet at the nursery. It's like a standard go-to answer. How big does this plant get? Three feet. I don't know why it's always three feet. They usually get a little bigger than what they say. So I would take that with a grain of salt. I would give it like six feet. If it gets three, four, five feet wide, it's okay. And don't put it in a plant. That they, if they're telling you it gets six feet wide, it's probably going to go seven, eight feet. You put that in a two-foot planter, and 
it's you're not going to have a good experience. And so it really, you know, the planter is a reference. So if you have a two foot planter, you 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 need to make sure you have plants that only get two three feet wide. If you have plenty of space, nice big planters, and you have a, a plant, because some plants get really wide, 10, 15 feet wide, you know, if you want them to touch each other, that's your reference. You would reference the spacing based on what you want every six feet. Do you want them touching within a couple of years? If you want space in between them, which I think most of us do nowadays, especially with low maintenance and this kind of aspect, it's, it's smart to, to understand what the spacing is in relation for the plants around them based on the size that they are. Oh, how far they are away from the house, away from neighbors. If the tree is going to get quite large and grow over the fence of the neighbors, know that, plan ahead accordingly, reference the fence on both sides, come back 10 feet, 12 feet, whatever is needed, and, and plant the tree there because it is going to grow. So again, it's kind of looking at the processes of plantings. You would go to the nursery, yes, pick out the things that you like, but look them up, find out what the ultimate size of them is before you purchase them, before you get all the plants delivered over there. And then when you set them all out, double check everything. Set all, I like to set all the plants out in the pots first before I start planting. And I like doing it all at once. I don't like going to the nursery, you buy two, three plants, a couple months later, come home with another plant, this plant, that plant. Once you have an established landscape, yes, you can, you know, for filling in, that makes sense. But if you're doing a project, it's best to get 20, 30 plants at a time, clear an area, plant it all, get all new irrigation to them, you know, um, do it all at once. Again, referencing the spacings, the ultimate sizes, just so that you have a, a really good, you know, time and really good results at the end of that. So it's process, referencing, doing your research and your homework before you start the project. Okay, so you can always catch us on Facebook, Chaparral Pavers. Submit your questions there if you want to get them heard here on Answered on the Radio. And you can always catch us on the web at ilovetocomehome.com. I am Fernando Martinez of Chaparral Pavers. We would love to hear from you. In fact, any way you want to get your question in, if you want it on Facebook, text me at the phone number or message us on the website. Whatever works for you. So, all righty. We'll stay tuned next week for another good show, and we'll see you then. Thanks again. This has been Patio Side Chats with Fernando Martinez from Chaparral Pavers. Go to ilovetocomehome.com to find out more or call 805-588-6917. And be sure and tune in next week at this same time for Patio Side Chats here on KSMA.